So I do want to um, kind of reassure you in the sense that I will be around. Um, and this class will meet next week and you will have readings as usual. Um, but there's a holiday on both Monday and Wednesday, the week after that. And so then the, the 26th and 28th. Um, on the 26th, we'll meet for you to present your research papers. And um, if you somehow get a better idea, they should be done, but if you get a better idea and want to revise them, that's all right. Um, I just want you to practice presenting something and having other people question. That's a oral communication uh, criteria and in our assessment, the assessment of AUW, we need to be offering students, assigning students uh, assignments in oral communication. So the 26th will be that. Um, given how few people are coming to class, that class might not last very long, but the students who don't come can at least watch, right? other people presenting in the process. And <clears throat> I think I might ask them to come onto office hours and do a presentation to me. Well, I guess I, guess I tell you, I would like you to do that. <laughs> I'll give you points if you do it. In other words, I can require it and say, you'll get docked if you don't do it. Or I could say, I would like you to do it and you will get points if you do it. So I do wanna stay positive. <laughs> so the 26th will be presenting your research and then the 28th will be presenting your final. It won't be due yet, but you need an outline. Um, and then again, you'll be subject to questions which should help you improve your outline. Um, and again, that class probably won't last that long, but I think partly having class, since I'm not having the papers due until the 1st of August, will help you refresh your mind, get focused. Um, I know you have to finish your other class probably around that time, but then you'll have a, a reminder, one more reminder, and then you'll be able to sort of finish it up. So, um, so I do. you do have a lot of days to do the work and you only have two more reading assignments. So in how many days, what have we got? One, two, three, uh, 21, 26 days or something, 25 days, there's only two more reading assignments. So please just pace yourself, do the 12 posts, do the three papers. If you didn't do your first paper, which was a thousand words, and the last one is now gonna be 1500, you can write a final that is 2,500 words. Um, I think that's all I want to say for housekeeping. The next thing was um, the assignment for today was harder than I was than I was thinking it was, and so I will lead you through it. If those of you listening thought it was hard, um, and I will send an email saying to the students. Um, who are going to look just at the YouTube or the video that they could just skim the reading and then look at the at the video and um, you know get through it. The reason I assigned it, that's the main thing, is to emphasize why there's this huge disconnect 
between the actual climate, the fact that we have all these scientists who are raising the red flag and, and something like the United States taking themselves out of the Paris Accord. Why? Why is there this incredible resistance to, to the facts? Who is profiting or what's going on in their head, right? And so that's the article today is explaining how the discipline of economics is taught to make environmental issues invisible. And it has been taught that way for generations. And it's a case of this pseudo rationality, mathematical models that claim to be rational. And this is what students get the first week in an economics class. And so they're trained the um, Western universities have trained young people not to see the environment. And that was what I liked about this article is that it, there's no recognition in the economics textbooks that there's any natural world that is, is providing the, um, you know, the kind of foundation for the creation of an economy. So that's what I want to get at. And um, the economy, economics teachers at Lyon College, um, one of them is from Bangladesh and one of them is from Poland. And so both of them, the one from Bangladesh, he's, he's uh, 60. So he grew up in Bangladesh quite a while ago. And it was the government that was corrupt and capitalism was coming in there. And he had the impression that it was going to make the country better. So he wanted to major in economics and he was pro-capitalism because he thought it was gonna help his country. And then he watched the way capitalism in the United States has become um, a kind of um, people in power are completely puppets to the capitalists. And so he didn't expect that. And he's changed his mind. He's much less of a cheerleader for capitalism. But it doesn't mean he's pro-socialism. He just wants it to be more regulated. It's not regulated enough in the US. And then the professor from Poland, um, his experience again was with the corruption of socialism when the politicians control the economy. And so again, capitalism looked really good to him, but it's, you know, it's gone too far and he's aware of that. But it's just this syndrome, this, uh, snowball you know that's got that's gone down the hill and it keeps building on itself and it's very hard to stop it um so then i was going to work with an economist from bangladesh and i went because he had been doing some research in bangladesh about and i'm not quite sure if this is the exact stuff. I'm not going to give his name, but it could be. This is the type of thing that is normalized, as far as I can tell. I was so angry when I left his house. I, you know, it was just about steam coming out of my ears, but um, he was absolutely trained in this view of being value neutral, right? We don't make values, you know, we just go into small towns and we interview people and ask them, would you like a factory in your town? <laughs> like, you know, and, you know, we find out if they would. It's just like, do you tell them that it's going to lower the water table in your town? Do they, do you tell them it's going to pollute the river? Do you tell them it's going to pollute the air? <laughs> oh, but we're value neutral. <laughs> What? So, I mean, 
that's not exactly what it was, but that's the kind of intellectual dishonesty that I see in the discipline of economics. It does not account for the exploitation of the natural world. It does not include at all the contribution that trees make to the replenishing of the resources from which the economy comes, all right? So what he's trying to say is that when you get an economics textbook, and I, I honestly think this is not the way economics is taught at AUW because I don't think they'd hire an economist that taught it that way. But the, the economics professors who teach at AUW are going to point out the problems because they live in the countries that are suffering from the problems, right? So I think you honestly get a much more accurate, a much more sane view of economics. So that's another reason why I think in my class, you ought to have a couple of lectures, right? We had the lecture, what has posterity done for me? The one kind of rationality is just calculating your own economic self-interest. And um, then today, I'm just gonna explain about the economics textbooks, just economics as a discipline. Um, so it's not just that guy's personal opinion. He did teach economics, but the article made it appear that it was a more like a personal opinion. This is that the discipline has been taught this way and um, that the people who go into economics tend to have a certain kind of personality. That was one of the articles. Maybe some of you at least read that newspaper article and maybe you have a reaction to that. Um, and then within, once you get a tenure track job, you have to keep publishing stuff that reinforces that point of view or you won't get published. So you'll lose your job. And then you have to keep feeding into the same destructive, environmentally destructive model in order to get status, in order to get a reputation in order to get invited to the next conference or whatever. And um, that, it's just really unhealthy. Um, but that's the bind that a lot of people get into as adults. Perhaps your relatives do. You have to get a job. If you have a family, you've got to support the family. And maybe you worked for a company that was a decent company and then they went rogue, right? They started to really do some environmentally destructive stuff. But that, you know, you have to have a job. And so people get stuck in situations they really don't uh, agree with, but they don't have options. So that another, again, a nice thing to me about AUW, it does have values, right? It's not value-free. It's promoting women's empowerment. It's, and it's promoting, you know, being critical thinkers about development, right? What does that mean? Because um, women are affected by the way development occurs. And today we're talking about economic development. And the guy is talking quite a bit about America, but it's even more true in developing countries that the problems in the US are the developing countries suffer for these problems even more. Um, so um, so that's, that's the reason I assigned this. And I will just pick out some ideas that I think are important and they are professional jargon. So that's why it's hard to read is this jargon, which is very ironic because when people talk about money, everybody knows what they're talking about. <laughs> people don't use jargon when they're talking about money. They say, what are we gonna, you know, how much money do we have? And what do we have to spend it on? And, you know, what are our priorities that, 
it's not oh, value added and value distributed. I mean, <laughs> this is not the way people think. Um, and then also what I said with the last article is people don't think in terms of maximizing their own uh, economic prosperity. They often think about their children, right? And so they will think about uh, providing for their children or they'll think about saving for their children's uh, education so they can have a future or they'll you know, shell out for certain things that aren't in their personal interest at all. So it, it's a very abstract model. Um, also, people are not just economic creatures. And so they have a lot of other values. And, and they don't necessarily prioritize a higher salary. Um, if the higher salary means you have to move away from everybody you love, or if the higher salary means you can never be home when your kids are growing up, or if the higher salary, um, oh yeah, I, I, another thing, a woman, I heard this woman talking about housing and how to be savvy about buying a house, whether you want to buy a house or rent and uh, what kind of house and, and she was talking just and started out just in terms of economics. What sort of houses uh, increase equity over time? What sort of house should you buy to be the richest possible when you end up selling it or when you retire? And, and she did finally say, well, there is this thing about, you know, houses are homes and that's where you, you, raise your family and you live your life. So, you know, maybe economics is not the only consideration. It's like, yeah, I guess not. This isn't a house, it's a home. This isn't, shouldn't be looked at as just a, a money, a pile of money. It's like where you're gonna raise your kids or something. So it's just gotten way out of hand. And so the discipline of economics doesn't explain people. And when it doesn't, the economists accuse people of being ir irrational. <laughs> it's like, what? Um, but, you know, somebody who obsesses about making money and cost benefit, that would be a person everybody else in the world would call irrational like completely out of bounds, uh, obsessed about money. That's not rational, but that's the model that John Locke bequeathed to us. He didn't mean to do that. And Adam Smith, they, they did not think that that kind of calculation was the most important way of thinking. John Locke thought you needed to believe in God and immortality of the soul. Locke and Smith really thought you need other values and Locke didn't want greed. That doesn't matter because this is what got passed down to posterity. These are the ideas that people picked up on and have used. And, and it explains why the U.S. would step out of the climate accord. It's partly because people who calculate their wealth are billionaires who got their money from fossil fuels and continue to get it. But it's partly, if it were only a few of those and everybody else in America was more savvy, the politicians would not get elected. The key is enough people think that way in America to vote for politicians who will leave the Paris Accord or they, we have an environmental protection agency and uh, Trump hired a person to run the agency that said, we're gonna make all our decisions based on business profit. Well, if businesses could profit in the way the economy is now without destroying the environment, 
we wouldn't have an environmental protection agency. We wouldn't need one. The reason we need one is because businesses are run to exploit the environment and we need laws to protect the environment. That's why you have the agency to enforce those laws. But if you put the person in charge who says, no, this is gonna, I'm gonna turn this into the environmental destruction agency, the pro-business environmental destruction agency. But what I want you to know is there's enough Americans that think like that, that we continue to elect people like that. Um, environmental issues are not a priority. And then Americans think in terms of cost benefit analysis, and they don't, they think in terms of value, value added, the kind of models that this article states, and they don't include the cost to the environment and also the value that trees and um, uh, water uh, swamps and all these things, the value that they add and the way that they provide resources from which the economy taps into. So not enough Mer Americans think that way. When they go to college, they're not taught to think that way. They're taught to think without considering the environment. And then they end up electing people who work, who just pass laws that reinforce that. So that's why the US stepped out of the Paris Agreement. Uh, and then the question for people in developing countries is, um, Good. Um, just a sec, Connie, but I will, I was, I keep thinking I'm about to quit. But for people in developing countries, when your best and the brightest go to the West to get educated, or if a person from the West comes to the best universities, are they still teaching this sort of model of economics? That would be what I'd be curious about. And um, I don't know if there's any research on that, but uh, you do at least have your experiences at AUW. Okay, so um, question. Okay, so Conig, um, about the economy, having a job, does it help the economy? Um, okay, right. So that's the question is how do you measure the growth of the economy. And again, this article says on a standard model, all it is is jobs. You know, if there's more jobs, then the economy is good. It doesn't ask, do these jobs destroy the earth? It doesn't ask, do these jobs destroy people? Do these jobs undermine the quality of life? Did people have a better quality of life when they had a different kind of economy? And, you know, on the on paper, it might have looked like there were fewer jobs, but the work that people was doing was more humane and they had enough food. Um, I mean, I don't want to idealize the um, poor farmers, right? But but like in India, if you have old uh, farming practices where you're living a sustainable life, I remember in Indonesia, the people had a fish pond, they had coconut trees and banana trees and they, you know, everywhere, like all this vegetation and all these vegetables and fruits and fish and some, a rice paddy, you know, they they ate really well but on an economic map it would look like they're desperately poor you know and um it's just the way the models work is they appear to be objective right and rational and value free and they're not in terms of the quality of people's lives so 
Okay, so someone in the village decides they want a better life. So they move into the city. There's air pollution, there's noise, there's crowding. They work in one of those informal, uh, you know, sort of booths in the city on the street selling something. Um, but maybe, you know, it, it counts in the economy. Maybe it's not the informal, it's some official job that gets recorded on the economist's uh, ledger. And so technically that person has a higher standard of living because they have a job and they didn't used to have a job. But the quality of their life is way worse right? They're away from family. They're subjected to all these negative influences. Now, again, I don't, that's an extreme case. All the, my main point is that you have to consider to what extent is this actually happening? Oh, so, okay. So kind of, do you at least understand that? Um, I'm just giving you a, a black and white case. Most, most things in human life are gray and their matter of degree. Plus, moving into the city 20 years ago is different than now because the air pollution is different and the noise level is different, right? So these are also things that are constantly changing. So my only, my main takeaway, hopefully your main takeaway, is that you have to be a critical thinker about this. You can't accept this stuff. You've got to question it. Um, you can't take it at face value, even though it appears value-free and objective and progressive and developing and all that wonderful stuff. Um, and even if the people who teach it believe that, like they believe they're gonna make your country a better place by increasing the number of jobs, right? You can just go, wait a sec. Not sure. Um, what are the salaries, right? So somebody comes, they're a textile industry Mongol, right? They have an international business chain making textiles and they're gonna come into this little town and give all these women these great jobs, right? <laughs> and so women that used to be home with their kids, ah, they weren't working and they didn't have any money. Okay, so they come to the textile industry and it's boiling hot and it's miserable work and they go home and they have to take care of their kids and they get way underpaid. Um, but, you know, it's a higher standard of living because they have an income and they didn't used to have an income. <laughs> so uh, that's kind of what I'm getting at is that I would be very curious if any of you want to do research about any of this stuff, um, because I'm sure there is a lot of research out there, but there's certainly a lot of potential research also. And this is where um, social science research is really helpful in situations like this, because the changes that occur you know, every year, every five years can make a real difference, right? So in philosophy, we just go, oh, it's the same old, same old, you know, it's great. It's like, oh. Uh, but in the social sciences, they can really nab it better. And they can find which countries are particularly hard hit or which little towns or which employers are particularly wicked, you know? So all there, there's a real benefit to mountains and mountains of research cranking out every year. Um, but it has to be the right kind of research. Other research, like economic research can be, well, how do you market to people in this country, right? Do you use religion or not, right? How do you manipulate these people into buying your product? Uh, that's, that's research too. <laughs> With a, you know, and it's value neutral, you know, people choose what they want. And so. <laughs> So um, yeah, so you need, a, you need to think, think through everything. So again, I'm talking a lot more than I had planned. 
So let me call on each person to see if they had any original reaction, um, if they skimmed it, if the newspaper article was of interest or anything. So Sauda, did you have any initial reaction? Uh, yeah, yes, Professor. Uh, so, I mean, there was like, uh, so from the two attachment, the first one, I mean, uh, there was like a lot of uh, articles in there. So the, I started with the first one. It was, well, it was kind of uh, more like harder than mm -hmm. the yes. usual for me personally, because like, Usually, I don't uh, read a lot about economics or anything. So it was like new things to think about. And like, I wasn't sure, Professor, how like this, uh, how were, if we were supposed to like read all of them, like all 16 pages. Uh, but yeah, I tried to skim through it. And it was like a lot of, surprising and new concepts to me. So for the, those I mainly just took in, uh, the second uh, article, global advertising, that, that one kind of really, you know, <laughs> made me think a lot. Did, did uh, you have time? I thought I posted it just a few minutes ago. Um. Yeah, I mean, I the second one I wrote, uh, I I read the whole thing, the global advertising one. I could read the whole thing and think, but the other one I only read the first one on, and then the other. Then it was like sixteen pages long, and oh, was I it really? I didn't, okay, yeah, I thought it was. I just came through it. the economics conception attachment. That one, it was like sixteen page, so I. Yeah, there was like a lot, uh, like quite a few articles in there. Okay, so six. Okay, yeah, I. That's why I'm. Okay, so the advertising one. What I decided, I just posted a. I thought like an hour ago, half an hour ago. Um, uh, no, professor, it was like posted. Oh, okay, not. You mean you edited the post or? Anyway, it's okay. I was going to let us read it during class, like later on. And um, I'll just give you time during class to read it. And then you yeah. can comment on it. So if that's okay, um, yeah. did you have any comment on the, the first one, the economics one? Okay, so the first one, I mean, it, it was like, uh, I mean, there's a lot of, new concepts for me so the consumption and you know the whole how the economics adding value and like how the whole cost benefit thing works it, those are like a lot of new things for me at least it, it seemed a little bit uh uh more complicated than i thought it would be yeah i regret um, I regret assigning it actually, but I didn't, I only no, I, just... I, Yeah, I know, I don't know. Maybe it's just Professor Me because I, because my major is environmental science, I don't really deal with economics as much. So it's probably only me, I think. We'll and see. and it, it, it's, it's still, it was like, I think beneficial to learn new things out of my uh, like usual courses. So it, it, it was okay. It's just that like the, I mean, just as you said, it's mostly all about like uh, benefits, like how uh, if the whole thing, it was, mainly i think uh, just it was all about only i mean i didn't find anything in environmental related things in there as much it's just all about products 
and how to like maximize profits and uh, how like everyone like the population kind of uh, relates to the whole economy and the, their like per capita how how much profit is gaining and all that so i don't i don't know how how i would like relate it to uh environment because it doesn't really talk about the environment as much it's just uh, taking our materials and just putting adding value and you know building things and just using it it, it that's the only mention of environment there that just taking materials and using it and building uh, uh, and whatever you know profit they could get out of those raw materials so they don't really view the raw materials as i mean anything I don't know how to express this. Like for me, I usually like in our press perspective or whatever, any materials or any natural resources, we we view it as something precious, I would say, and we don't treat it as only as materials, like material things, like objects. But it's uh, in here, all of it, like just the whole environment is like treated as object and just things for us to use. So that was like the only environmental related things I would say. And the rest of it, it was just all about economy and how to like gain profit and how to avoid uh, um, waste, I guess in their eyes, I mean, in economic value from that perspective. Right. Okay, so when they talk about, he says, he just, the environment is just this inert matter from which the economy emerges, right? Yeah. And do you remember uh, Francis Bacon? That was like the first second day of class. He said, knowledge is power, right? Yeah. We understand nature just to gain power over it. And so that was the enlightenment view is that nature is like a blank slate, right? That we are going to exploit for human purposes. Um, yeah, I... Does that make sense? I mean, I just want people to see the connection here is that we still, <laughs> People yeah. think a lot in those ways, even though we know that that is not so. But still, yeah. yeah. So I guess that those are the like basis for like concepts that those concepts are the basis for this whole system and like this whole thoughts. And, you know, just this whole idea of economy and everything. That's why I guess they don't mention environment at all, or just like they don't even consider environment as anything like in a, a whole other entity or anything. It's just like objects to explore it. And it's a, it also like kind of makes me think uh, about like, uh, you know, how, like how do people like assign value to things? Yeah. We we uh, we are like we read about happiness, like pleasure and pain, right? And and here it's just uh, if we make money, it's a pleasure. But if if just making money and destroying the environment in the process, it's. And it doesn't seem to be any concern here, but like, isn't it, we are already like, isn't it like we are already, we're making money, but is it really bringing, is this whatever they're considering profit right now? Is it really profit? I mean, if we think about the future, it's not really profit right now. It's, it's the thing that's going to harm us and bring 
like our destruction. So it's not really profit. I know. So how were like, I guess people aren't thinking about it in that way that it's just the assigning value and assigning board to some things. I mean, the yeah. whole concept are really like blindsided, I would say. That's right. Who gets to decide? Um, yeah, and the people who are deciding are ignorant in a lot of ways. They're blind. Um, yeah, that's a major point. Um, Anindita, did you have a reaction to the reading? Um, yeah, Kanij, is there something you wanted to say? Maybe she, maybe your um, mic doesn't work. Um, okay. What about you, Sristi? No? Okay, Rossi? Hi, Dr. Bike. So for me, I want to talk a little bit about um, marginalized benefits and marginalized costs. So typically business owners will shut down their company when their marginalized cost is greater than their marginalized benefit. And we have seen that a lot of these business owners are the ones who started um, started killing trees and stuff and causing deforestation to get, get their benefit. And they know that the cost benefit of deforestation is very low because all you get is just lumber but the cost uh, the marginal cost is a lot we get mudslides erosion and all these environmental concerns then i just don't understand why they wouldn't stop their actions when the marginalized cost is much greater than the marginalized benefit like i don't even know what they're thinking you know yeah, they don't include that in the cost. That's what they're thinking. <laughs> Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. It doesn't make sense. S E N S E. It makes sense. C E N T S, right? <laughs> it it yeah, the the way the economists calculate benefit is your okay, you make a product. You make uh, tables, that was the example, right? Yeah. And then you sell the table and you have to run a company. So you have the cost of the employees' uh, salaries and building the building and the machines and the electricity, right? And so at the end of the day, all your costs and then what you sell the table for, how much money you take in, and then that's your profit. And that determines whether you're successful. Yeah, and you don't include at all the fact that, gee, your factory, uh, uh, let's see, broke down. You have to build a new factory because a mudslide <laughs> covered up your factory, right? That's not included. Yeah. So that's the absurdity and the craziness of that cost benefit, right? Analysis. And he said, you know, that maybe long ago, the cost, there wasn't costs like that to deforestation, right? There weren't mudslides and there wasn't air pollution and there wasn't, you know, all the, but now there is and they still don't count it in. Yeah, it's just. <sighs> well, we need a new paradigm, right? And yeah. I think developing countries are going to be the ones that come up with the new paradigm. Um, it's, it, it is crazy that the US is not going to make a trillion bucks or more, you know, trillions of bucks on the green technology just because we're stubborn and we're proud and ignorant and set in our ways because the, the trillions of bucks is sitting there waiting to get made if you just go green and you just start 
being reason being truly reasonable and not in this old model of reasonable does that make sense okay. go ahead yes but professor like why not though i mean it it doesn't make sense in because the fossil fuel it's not like okay abundant source like it, it will run out one day one way or another it's not going to last forever so we have they have there there is no other option for us we have to switch whether we like or like it or not because it's going to run out one day i mean if we wait till it runs out the like irreparable damage that we will do to our planet even if we don't think about that if we don't care how much we damage the environment how much people we hurt even if they don't care about it it's still they'll still have to see the end goal right that the it this won't last forever so i mean sustainability they'll they have to think about that right it's just the reality so why not switch well not when that if you if you uh you know if the government our government would set a bunch of regulations and so businesses can compete for products and they can start selling them then they can sell enough stuff so that they can start selling it cheaper than gas and oil and they could make trillions of bucks in other words, this isn't even good on a cost benefit, <laughs> right? It's, it's so absurd, Soda. It's like Sristi said, people lose sight. Rich people really get obsessed. And I, it's been really hard for me to realize how obsessed and how isolated a wealthy person can be. So I read three books. You know, I read a thousand pages on some of these people and the way they have lived their lives and the way they think, because I had to try and drive it in my head, you know, what is going on? Um, but you know what, uh, each of you can think about, you know, some wonderful entrepreneur in Cambodia or Bangladesh is going to figure out that he can make a ton of money if he just hires in a few American green tech guys and starts a company, you know, and gets the government to give him some incentives and start selling this stuff to his people and, you know, kiss, kiss off the U.S., who cares, you know, and U.S. engineers will come because they care about green, you know, someone will say, well, you're betraying your country. I was like, no, I'm not. I'm just trying to go green. So I just think there must be, I don't know, thousands of green engineers in the U.S. that can't get jobs because of the stupid political situation. And the people in developing countries, some savvy Bangladeshi is going to figure this out, I hope and just hire these people in the US and make them sell, make your country a bunch of money. I think that would be great. Why don't you do it, Sauda? I mean, Professor, it's, that's the problem, right? Because the fossil fuel people, the OPEC and like all this country, even Middle East, they won't let green energy be cheaper than the I know. Uh, I know they just keep hiking up the prices or making it lower so green energy can't find a foot in the market that's what they do I know and that's what the whole politics is about and we just need someone with money and power to get behind green energy so it can you know well Bill Gates is doing that now but I again it was 2006 before it crossed his mind. It's just like, where have you been for the last 30 years? Inside of his own head, I guess. Um, well, but things will change and it will be interesting. That's for sure. Um, okay, so let's see. All right, so we've done that round. And Sristi just made the comment, you know, that um, 
uh, well, caring for that, you know, when people care about money too much, they ignore the environment um, and use nature. Um, the greed, the desire to make a lot of money corrupts things. Now that's exactly what Adam Smith wrote a whole book about that, the importance of teaching generosity. And John Locke knew that, these guys knew that, but you know, they're, they, the capitalist cite John Locke and Adam Smith more than anybody else to justify what they're doing. Yeah, it's like they use Christianity for whatever, and you guys know people use Islam for anything. So, um, so Srisi says, I have seen pe I have seen some people in my country have the thought to become economically successful. You should only focus on business and profit. They're asked about the environment. They don't have time to think about it. Uh, but the raw materials for their business come from nature. Yeah, I until somebody figures out how to make a lot of money on it. Um, and then in, in my country, for example, if you have a uh, Prius, a hybrid car, you have to pay more taxes. You have to pay more road taxes. <laughs> I can't even remember. Oh yeah, the reason you have to pay more taxes or that hybrid cars cost more because they're taxed is because you don't use as much gas so you don't pay as much gas tax. <laughs> I mean, really, and they're just raising the price of a hybrid car. They, it, go. Oh, it's, it's crazy. <laughs> All right, so let's go to the article. And so I'll give you the jargon, right? We'll go through a little bit of this jargon. Um, all right, so this, this page, um, oops, let me highlight. some of the points I wanted. Okay, so here's one issue. While all the countries have to worry about both population and per capita consumption. So we've talked about this before. It isn't necessarily the number of people, it's also the per person consumption. It's evident the South needs to focus more on population and the, and the North more on consumption. And that's likely to play a role. So you guys can keep an eye out for this because um, in the future, there will be North-South uh, treaties and uh, relationships. Why should the South control population if the resources saved just get gobbled up by Northern overconsumption? That's a good question, right? Why should the North control its consumption if the saved resources just go to allow a number, a larger number of poor people, right? So everybody points their finger at everybody else. Um, so, so that's that's a problem we've seen before: uh, the overconsumption and population, rather than um, other issues. Military militarization is also a big issue. Um, all right, so here's, here's how he talks about value added. The nature is just looked at, well, um, okay, nature is just looked at as, a, as building blocks that give utility to human beings, right? That human beings organize, right? They add to the building blocks of nature. Nature is just this inert thing that has this potential and we're the ones that make it into something valuable, right? Just like John Locke, he says that um, the earth, God gave us the earth to use. This is the exact philosophy. God gave us the earth to use for our well-being, the rational person, the rational and industrious person works up the land 
and deserves the fruit of his labor, right? This is exactly the same model, which drives me nuts. Um, because that nature itself had no value, but um, the production, right? The agency, the useful structure, what becomes useful is when um, useful structure is added to the natural resource flow by the agency of labor and capital stocks, right? So nature is just there and then labor gives it value. The value of the useful structure imparted by labor and capital, that's value added. So you work hard and you also uh, produce a product and also capital. You actually, yeah. I'm really sorry to interrupt you, but I just got a phone call from my sister that um, my brother-in-law is connected to a COVID case and my house might be under quarantine. And right now I'm not at my house. So I need to go and get my stuff. I'm at my boyfriend's house studying. So I need, I really need to go to my house to get my stuff in case my house is in quarantine. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much. Of course. Oh my goodness. I'm still in the call with my sister. Oh, well, yeah, we got to deal with that. The too. only thing that I feared is now coming. So do you have to go to your house then and just stay in your yeah. house? No, no, I have to go to my house to get my stuff and come stay at my boyfriend's house because um since my my because i most of the time i stay here so oh. since my brother-in-law is connected like i have to like depart myself from my family for a while okay are they gonna just put your stuff outside the front door or something probably like something like that okay well Thank you, Dr. Bike. yes sorry rossi no it's okay okay so go ahead um, all right, so we had this, all right, I, ho I hope everybody understands what I'm getting at, is that labor gives nature value plus the capital. So you get profit so you can reinvest, you can build a factory, you can start another company or another factory. So uh, you work hard, you make money, you make some extra money, you invest, you start another company and another product. And so it's all of that stuff that's superimposed on the natural world is, is, is what's called value, value added. And then that's what's consumed, which again, increases the economy. So value added provides jobs and then people buy this stuff and that provides more jobs. And then there's more companies. And so everything important is completely just superimposed on nature and it has nature plays no role, right? That to which value is being added is the flow of natural resources, but it's conceived as an indestructible building blocks of nature, right? They're just there and they have unlimited resources and we just create these economies from them and we produce products and we consume products and everybody's happy, right? That's how you maximize happiness. And then you increase the nas national, um, the gross domestic product, the, you increase the economy and that makes everybody happy, <laughs> right? And this is how we're maximizing happiness. So, I hope you understand that. That's the language that he's talking about. Um, okay, that to which value is being added is just a homogeneous, indestructible building blocks, atoms. It's just a bunch of atoms, right? And there's no scarcity of atoms, right? It's inert, undifferentiated, interchangeable, super abundant. Um, and that's the way the models work. So that was um, the point there. And then, um, and then he, you know, he's just taking issue with it. Um, the fact that 
um, when we use natural capital, when we use natural resources, uh, nature herself spent a whole lot of time creating those resources like oil. And uh, we just use it as if there had never been any, you know, processes, natural processes that went into creating it. Um, and, and we also know that there's a big difference between the original resource and waste, right? So the entropy. So the energy put into the nature's creation of the oil is very different from the waste products. The waste products don't have anywhere near the potential, right, to generate um, more stuff. And so the economic models do not account for the second law of thermodynamics. The overall amount of material stuff is the same, but it's degenerated into a much more dissipated form that is much less useful. And the our economic Economic models do not uh, include that. They don't include that any value that was uh, that was added by nature, natural processes produce value. Like um, bees, you know, pollinate the the flowers. And if we try, it, we're killing off the bees, right? Because of the way, because of our kind of pesticides. And people have calculated how much money it would cost to replace machine uh, bees with machines, right? It would cost an incredible amount of money, but just think about it. It'll create jobs and it'll, you know, all these people will get these jobs creating these pollinating machines and then someone will sell the pollinating machines and the overall economic economy in that country will go up. <laughs> so if we kill off all the bees, all the economies in the world will, there'll be one more product that people will make and sell. That's the attitude, okay? Um, and you know the trouble is it's going to be expensive, but that's okay. No, no country. Every country lives in more and more debt, so money seem, doesn't seem to have any meaning anyway. So, um, okay, a tree is turned into a table. Um, so he gives that example of a tree is cut and turned into a table, and. Um, all the economic system it talks about is how many people buy tables and how much money the company makes. And um, it doesn't talk at all about uh, replenishing the trees or the whatever, what other services the trees gave, like, you know, carbon, absorbing carbon, or preventing mud slides. It doesn't have anything like that. The economic system is the, the tables and the price, the, the number of jobs you create, and then the price you sell them and the profit you make and your reinvestment. And you maybe set up another table company in another country or something. Um, let's see. All right, I think. I think I will, you know, and the jargon had to do with marginal costs. Let me do one last paragraph here at the end, and then I'll let you take a break. Um, all right, so here, if you believe all value comes from labor and capital, and that nature contributes only a material substratum that's non-destructible and superabundant, and hence without any value, then this is a quite reasonable view, right? This is the, that notion of reasonable. Is your country poor? Well, just add more value by your own labor. You already have your labor. You can accumulate your capital or borrow it from abroad, which of course developing countries do, and then they get into debt. Um, the other thing is that, um, 
the rich capitalists have a way of um, maintaining low salaries for labor because there's so many poor people. They need, they benefit from having a lot of poor people because they will work for a lower wage, which means the owner will gain more profit, right? And the overall economy of the country will be higher because it's it's based on how much the, the cost, how much people pay for the products that the owners who live in that country make. Um, so you already have, okay, stop one and get busy. Um, this view is common among neoclassical economists. Uh, it's a corollary to John Locke's justification of private property to claim something as one's property, right? So we're back to Locke. And there's another place in this article that referred to um, Mill. So that's, that's what I wanted you to get out of this article. And next time, if I do assign it, I will definitely just pick uh, paragraphs for students to read. So I have 17 after the hour. And so let's break until 30 minutes after the hour. Is that okay? And then we'll, yeah, okay. Then we'll pick up after that.
All right, so in the next section, there's another, I had you read at four pages from, three pages from another article and then a newspaper article. So let's go over this for a second. Um, and then it does link to the uh, global advertising ar uh, argument. So I think what I'm gonna do is just sort of show you that there's a link and then the class will be over at that point. And then next time we can re read um, the pages, just excerpts from the global advertising. And then there's another article and I'll choose excerpts from that called Dysfunctional Civilization. And it just talks about how dysfunctional <laughs> everything is. But you could tell by the way ads, ads, they tap into any sort of psychological weakness people have, any kind of dysfunction, and then they magnify it and they make it worse. Because if you have a problem, you know, psychological issues, you're going to tend to want to consume things to cover up for it or make up for it or any, anything else. But first, we have to do what the economists think, right? The economists start out with nature as this just limitless bunch of atoms. And then we give it value. We work it up. And then we sell a product. And then we make a profit. And the national, uh, the domestic national product, the gross national product, all those economic indicators, right, created by economists of whether the country is, is doing well, is how many jobs were created this month and how our salaries are, are increasing, our, how many new businesses were opened up. Oh my gosh, the US is so dysfunctional this way because we lower the interest rate. Uh, it's very low. So that encourages people to borrow money. So they borrow money to start a business. And so you could say, oh, all these businesses started. Yeah, but none of them are making any money, right? And they're all in debt. Well, then you stop counting the debt and you just count if they made money or not. And then uh, people will buy a house and um, it, you don't count that they're in debt. You just count that, oh, they're making the mortgage payments on their house. So everything's peachy keen. And the same with a car. And so Americans are just in incredible debt. Uh, but as long as the interest rates are low, they will still keep borrowing money. And the economy describes this as positive and politicians get elected on the basis of all this stuff that it does not tell you if, human, if people's lives are, are high quality of life and it tells you nothing. It just completely ignores the exploitation of nature and the costs of nature, of natural. And it also doesn't count human exploitation, right? What are people working? See, in the US, they'd be working two or three jobs with no benefits. But hey, if every person is working two or three jobs, look at how many jobs there are in the US. Everybody's got a job. Oh, geez. So, so that it's incredible how self-serving and how ignorant the whole economics language and culture is and how it still gets worshipped and it gets called rational and objective and neutral. Um, <laughs> I forgot what I asked. I just probably, does that make sense? Um, all right, so let's go with the second article. And I hope that, you know, um, you're, you're getting something out of it at this point when I go over it slowly. Um, so the point here is taking that utilitarian model of people that you want to maximize happiness. So you take the John Locke model, 
but you combine that with utility. So um, uh, cost benefit analysis, when the benefits are greater than the cost, then you're happy. And that's what happiness is. And, and uh, if you remember Bentham, and if you remember this idea that we're just a kind of animal and we experience pleasure and pain like every other animal, and when the pleasures are greater than the pains, then we're happy. Um, and so you look at a person as a set of preferences, right? The individual is, is okay. The person in, on your, under utility is treated as a bundle of preferences to be juggled in cost benefit analysis. So the well-functioning society that is free and equal, the free society allows people to calculate their own happiness, to juggle costs and benefits, and then to consume as they like based on the maximizing what they perceive as happiness. And he's arguing that, wait a second, we're more than just that. People should be respected as advocates of ideas which are judged in relation to the reasons, right? So you can have um, health, right? And environmental statutes, like you can value becoming sustainable or you can value um, your health more than your consumption of physical products. Um, Let's see, by protections beyond what are efficient, right? So legislators are supposed to create laws that are focused on higher goods, right? A different vision. So a collect collective values and also collective well-being, not necessarily just personal well-being. And so I will tell you, I, I don't know if you know this, and I don't know if it's true in your countries, but again, in, in the US where science is supposedly, you know, this great thing, um, there, was, there were a number of months during the Trump administration uh, when the Trump and the people he talked to in the, in the, the Oval Room or whatever, were deciding they did a cost benefit analysis and they decided that the cost of shutting down the economy was greater uh, than the cost of letting people die. And so the policy for a while was to let, let the virus spread to everyone until you got herd immunity, until enough people had gotten it and they were immune or, and the sick people died off, that it would self-correct, right? And you'd get over it. That really was their policy because then the economy <coughs> wouldn't, wouldn't pay a price. <clears throat> and there were a lot of people in the US who uh, were really angry that the economy, you know, that businesses were closed because in their view of a cost benefit, the cost of closing businesses was higher than the cost of people dying. <laughs> and 600,000 people died, right? Unnecessarily, truly. But there are still people, I'm sure, who thought that that was a better calculation. And they probably thought we never should have had a lockdown. Um, I think, what might have put a damper on that was again businessmen that we that if we wouldn't have a lockdown they would never be able to fly anywhere outside of the country and so their their businesses would be really crippled because uh american businesses would not be allowed to operate right um or there wouldn't be any exchange and that would really cripple the economy so in my own mind, that's probably why we eventually had a lockdown, because we hadn't quite calculated our cost benefit analysis enough, <laughs> but it never changed the basic foundation. It's all about businesses making money. Um, yeah, if the 
our airline industries really took a hit, right? If we didn't have a lockdown, then you know we wouldn't be allowed to fly abroad and the airline industries would be hit even harder. <laughs> I'm sure that was the calculation, it had nothing to do with people dying, right? It wouldn't even be that bad for those, the sick people and the poor people and the people who are compromised. They should die off, right? This is uh, nature's way of taking care of the weak. <laughs> yeah, probably yeah. It's the same people who thought like, let's let the people who will die from COVID die. And then, you know, our population problem will be solved. Did, I mean, were there people in your countries that thought like that? Yeah, some, some thought it's just a, a punishment from God that okay. to just clear out. Yeah, I mean, there were Americans that thought that too. It's just um, the newspaper will tend to, to cover the cost benefit. Um, but there were, yeah, there were a number of the religious ones. Does anybody else want to make a comment about their countries? Do you think anybody did a cost benefit analysis? Or do you think it was mostly just religion that caused led to resistance? Or in your countries, do most people just want to get the vaccine and they want, they're willing to lock down because they understand public health or? Um, okay, so. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if you talk about the understanding public health in my area, so even in my village area, uh, professor, you know, that a lot of corona, you know, COVID-19 patient has been found and they are even not, and there are a lot of public health workers who are working with like, you know, um, awareness about the vaccination thing and all, but when in the very first time government was announced about the vaccinations, still they are not taking vaccine because they thought that in terms of religion okay if someone has you know did a great scene or like very you know big scene something in their life so this is as a result of this you know so okay. they're not our at all that's they just blame the religion and then this this kind of things even not all of them professor some of them and most of them are thinking that way and that, that is one of the problem to, you know, mm -hmm. the people. Right. I don't know how, yes, but they're suffering a lot even. Uh, in in period, uh, in my area, there is no COVID-19, but as it is, you know, contagious and then the infectious disease, it's like it spreads very rapidly, right? But now the getting the situation getting very worse. But still, you know, yesterday I was talking with my, you know, uh, uh, like, uh, what is that? Okay, mother, no, not mother-in-law. In-law, mother-in-law? No, you know, my, my mom's mother, I forgot, oh. grandma. Grandma. <laughs> yeah, and he is very old, she is very old. And I was, I, I was very worried because she's very much older. And I just told her, uh, grandmother's taking the vaccination and all when the government is going to announce. And she told me a lot of things regarding religion, nothing is going to happen. This is this. I, 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 you know, I was trying to make her understand, but not because she understand the hard way, you know. Even she is not trying to understood what I'm trying to say. This kind of things happen, Professor. The mental, you know, the pattern, the, the way they're thinking. Yeah, okay. So Any, a lot, yeah. Right. Anybody else? want to clock in because um, what's important here is that what percentage of people are actually thinking like citizens, right? How many people are thinking in terms of public health, in terms of, I have a responsibility to wear a mask and stay sheltered in place because other people might get sick, right? And because I don't, this is one thing, I had this image in my head of going into a hospital and having to look the nurses in, in the eye and say, 
I was irresponsible and now you have to suffer for it, right? I that's just the way I think. Like there are all these and also the all the workers, frontline workers, right? If I'm irresponsible and then I go to the grocery store, I subject everyone in the grocery store to more risk. And I just I don't have any, I don't think I have any right to do that, right? Because I just think in terms of citizenship uh, and how to create a stable society. And, but boy, I just don't think there are that many people who think that way, which really worries me. But the way they do think is what these, um, what these authors are saying. That's why I did want you to read this. Um, this guy, the modern world, all right, as opposed to the ancient. So I hope, you know, you'll reflect on this a little bit because now we've read Aristotle, that's the ancient world, the ancient virtues. We are social and political beings by nature and the virtues, generosity, mag magnanimity, um, anger, um, ambition, honor, all of those things are exercised in relation to other people. And it's not an individually oriented ethic. It's all social life. We are social and political by nature. And so ruling for the sake of the ruled, whatever authority you have, making sure you use it for the benefit of the people over whom you have it so that they can flourish as a parent, as a teacher, as a coach, as a mentor, as a guide, as a preacher, as a whatever, right? So it started out with this inequality and to be a good person, you use your inequality, your advantage for the well-being of the people who need it. So that's the ancient view, right? Modern view is freedom, individuality, rights, uh, rational calculation, and that's the modern view. It emphasizes civil liberties, my freedom to be left alone, political liberties, the right of privacy, and the right of property. I hope that makes sense to you, right? My right to live as I like, remember John Locke's on liberty principle, the right to do what I want to do as long as I don't hurt somebody else. And then property, the right to work up property. So the modern world values that as opposed to community and participation. And that's the ancient. Um, I, does everybody, could you just, you can put on the chat if you want. Are you following that? When I point that out, can you understand that that's why I assigned what I assigned? Because these more contemporary things, they understand that it's the result of this whole history, this intellectual history. Do people understand that? Does that make sense to you? You can say yes or no. Or... Oh, yes, Professor. I mean, it, it, I mean, it says modern world, but I, I feel like it's mostly a, American values or like Western values, probably, because at least for where I live or like in Asia, Asian countries, uh, like community and families are like valued more than like individual rights. So uh, I think, I mean, but I can see that our values and like our societies are also changing and you know adopting American values really rapidly. So maybe we will become like that as well soon. I, but I also think women get caught really in the middle of it because the values of community end up that she can't develop her capabilities, right? which again, I call it Aristotelian rather than modern, right? Um, 
And so women often get caught because if they really want to go to college and they want to juggle family and career, and they're given this language of rights, right? You have a right to an education, you have a right. Well, a lot of people associate that with um, selfishness, right? Self-interest and um, anti-religion, you know, goes against God and all that stuff. So can that, do you understand that, Soda, that women often get caught in the middle of this false Either. yeah yeah okay it's just that like because women are like in patriotic societies women are already you know confined and like at a disadvantage most of the time so the individual rights and individual you know my right to education my right to you know own property my right to work and like be independent, like uh, financially independent, all of those like goes into individual rights. And when we are pushing that, obviously we are, it's unfair to women a lot because we're not allowed to have those things that everybody like men have. But when, we are pushing all those values. We are also kind of destroying the communal and family values, but it doesn't have to be that way. It doesn't right. have to be either or. That's right. Or that's that. why, that's why, I, right. that's why I frame it in yeah. women have the same need to develop their natural capacities, right? Does that make sense? And they have a natural yeah. capacity for intellectual uh, citizen engagement, politic, you know, being good citizens, being, uh, they're smart. So they just have a natural need to develop as human beings, which is mm -hmm. not, yeah, okay. I hope you understand that because I think it really is important. Otherwise women get caught in this either or, and both sides of that are structured by men for men, right? Yes. <laughs> yes. Community means, yeah, you play the role of wife and mother and you put up and shut up and it's a great community. On the other hand, rights means, you know, selfishly calculating your self-interest and being greedy, SOB and blah, 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 blah. And, you know, no, that's the way men define it. Men have done that. Yeah. Okay. But like, but if the men do this, it's not selfish, right? No, it's, it's normal. <laughs> yeah, it's rational. <laughs> yeah, not only that, one of the students, I think from Afghanistan, but I can't remember, they, they said that the reason COVID happened was, oh, I think Kashmir actually, was because women are so corrupt and they're going to college and God is allowing this to happen as a, you know, wake up call <laughs> to send the women back home, you know? Um, yeah, it, it, yeah, that's why I hope, you know, that capabilities model that it helps you under, I mean, to me, I needed some sort of theoretical framework that was really satisfying, that really hit the spot, right? Because you know what you don't want, but if, that's all that men will give you, you're stuck. You're either selfish or you're frustrated the rest of your life, right? And that's not fair. <laughs> um, and the UN is, you know, capabilities is the UN. So it's not just ancient, it's contemporary and it doesn't have to be Aristotle's sexism and all that stuff. But anyway, so the individual, he says, acts, asks only to be protected by laws in, in the pursuit of his own self-interest. Do you remember when I talked about Locke and I said, the only purpose of government is military and police, just to keep nasty people off of me while I sit and work hard and create value, right? And that's, he's saying, this is still the model that we use and it's so dated. And he points that out, right? Locke and Mill. Um, all right. Um, 
Yeah, he even, he gives examples like human beings actually do have values greater than just profit. Uh, we actually uh, care about worker health and safety. We regulate them. You know what? There's plenty of companies that try to get out of regulations and try to take away those regulations. Um, my daughter actually worked for the Department of Labor in Washington, D.C., and that's one of their divisions is to enforce uh, worker health and safety laws. But uh, Trump would put somebody in charge of the Department of Labor who himself had been sued. He owned Carl's Jr. Uh, chain food chain and had been regularly sued right for underpaying workers and trump puts that guy in charge <laughs> to enforce these laws yeah that's likely so you know i mean people are even worse than this um are so anyway yeah most people do have values other than simply money but it does get pretty crazy how out of balance it can get. And it can be, it can shock certain people. Um, so he's saying we just have to balance these different values. Um, and I'm saying there's certain people who really, um, really put money way ahead of other things. Um, here's another sentence that I think is good that Cost-benefit analysis treats all value judgments uh, as just statements of preference, attitude, emotion, right? They're not, there's no objective value, like sustainability as an objective value. No, no, it's just a preference. It's how you feel. It's completely subjective, um, right? The only thing that's objective is how many people you're employing, what salary you're paying, what profits you're making. That's objective. Everything else is subjective. <laughs> Jeez. Uh, yeah, and they believe it. And then uh, actually something is valuable according to how much people are willing to pay for it, right? And so if people aren't willing to pay, for environmental protection, well, that's the way it is, you know, we won't have it if people, uh, yeah. So, um, all that matters is if they're willing to pay, not their reasons. And so he gives examples, again, he gives examples of, he uses Carl Rogers, which is another, um, Okay, supposedly they're preserving neutrality, they're value neutral. Um, abortion, right? So let's just decide abortion according to how much people are willing to pay, right? You can make it, if you make uh, it difficult enough for women by closing down all the abortion clinics except one in your state, or if you, you know, what they did is you have to, the hospital where abortions are conducted has to have um, uh, aisles that are three feet wider than any hospital in the country, right? <laughs> or um, they just make all these laws that make the cost benefit calculation such that a woman, you know, the cost is too great. So she won't get one. Um, the, the trouble is the people who, the, the, anyway, the politicians who benefit from keeping, from adding all these um, laws and conditions are also the ones who are destroying the environment, lowering uh, salaries, doing a whole lot of other things that people don't even notice that are costing them their quality of life. And so all these things are interconnected. You know, the overall cost of voting for someone because they're against abortion, the cost to you is that you're going to have a worse job with worse conditions and your kids will have worse schools to go to. 
and all this other stuff, you'll have more air pollution, everything, except maybe a few women in your state might not get abortions, but not very likely. The, the abortion number of abortions tends to go up when women are poorer or they're more desperate. And so the Republicans make people poorer and more desperate and more ignorant. So they have more abortions. Uh, so even this kind of calculation isn't even really true. Um, all right, so do you decide whether, yeah, whether the war in Vietnam was justified just on a cost benefit? No, it has nothing. That's just crazy. Creationism should be taught in the public schools. Uh, what's the cost? What's the benefit? Whether black and white people should be segregated, right? Um, yeah, I mean, I remember somebody saying, well, during slavery, the unemployment rate was zero. There was no unemployment. So it was good. They really say that. Like that zero. Make any sense? What? I mean, of course not, because most people, like half of the population, is under slavery. So it's like unpaid worker. It's what? <laughs> right to try and put that run everything through the cost benefit sh benefit shredding machine and calling that objective and everything else subjective. That sort of, you know, most people, even if people will think it sounds good at first and they'll try to be rational, they never are. <laughs> they always think of other stuff that they care about. And um, the main thing is you better rethink this from the beginning so you don't get you don't realize you're getting sucked into this system where rich capitalists are exploiting you. Um, and then he gives, by contrast, Kant. And the thing that's interesting about Kant, we like you know Kant now, right? Kant says you shouldn't worry about consequences or pleasures and pains at all, right? Certain values are just true. The trouble is that, that Kant also detached mind from body. And so he thought it was all right for animals to be used as means to the end of human beings, right? So Kant would have thought it's all right to treat nature um, as a means to an end, right? But so this guy's point isn't really about that. It's about that some things are just good or bad apart from preferences, right? Pleasures and pains. So my point here is, is just that the guy doesn't have, a, he, he, you know, his idea of an alternative is still wrapped up in that old paradigm without him pointing it out or realizing it, I guess. It's still a modern enlightenment paradigm. Um, let's see. Let me, oops, let me get to a couple other things. Um, whoops. All right. Surely, all right, over here he says, surely environmental questions, protection of the wilderness, habitats, waterland, um, involve moral and aesthetic principles, not just economic. Um, so what happened is they should have, but in my country anyway, nothing's gonna change unless it's economic. People will not go green unless it's cheaper. I can tell because <laughs> what's happened in my country is that because of advertising political rhetoric, um, people get, if, you know, it's that damn government it's telling me when, whether I can breathe or not, right? The whole thing is about government intervening in my life. And so I'm not gonna wear a mask because that government, they can't tell me, they're, not, they're trying to control my breathing, right? That's the way people think of it. And they're trying to tell me what kind of car to drive. No, government, leave me alone. I'll drive whatever car I wanna drive, right? 
they're telling me I got to put windows, you know, the insulated windows on my house. That government, get them out of my life, you know? And, and so if, if the government tries to do anything for public health, public well-being, it's, it's a dictatorship. It's a tyranny. They're trying to control me. And, and uh, that is, it really is. It's the point where this combination of that plus this fear, right? I mean, Americans are afraid of the future because it's not going to be like the past. And so they're, they don't want to change because then there's this sort of dark hole in the future. They'd have to admit they really don't know what's coming and they have to adapt. And so it's, it's amazing to watch people when they react in such an emotional way to stuff that's just based on facts. It's not even values anymore, right? It's, you don't try to appeal to values. You just say, well, you know, uh, the weather, it's like, haven't you noticed the weather? No, it's, they're just so afraid and they just call it government intervention in my life. Okay, so these articles were just about how economists obsess about numbers and trying to explain everything in terms of numbers. And if you remember, when we talked about Kant, um, he was a mathematician and he wanted things to be objective, right? And he wanted things to be universally true, right? And so on the one hand, the, the author said, yeah, but he had these absolute values. But I would say, but also he had this very disembodied mind, you know, mathematical way of doing things. Um, so there is that sort of ambiguity about how a Kantian would think, how someone trained in mathematics might think. And so the point here is that there are certain kinds of people who really want to get a grip on stuff through mathematical models and they fall in love with their models. And then if people, if the models don't work, then it's people's fault because they're irrational. Um, and so they, you know, they just say, well, how I can't possibly do this. It's not my fault that I'm using these models. It's, it's the fault of people that won't follow cost-benefit analysis. Um, all right. Um, okay, so in my country, Alan Greenspan, um, the reason we had a housing collapse is that the housing market was, the prices were just going way up and Greenspan was supposed to hire the interest rate so that people would stop buying houses because the interest rate would be too high. And he didn't do that. And when the economy collapsed, he actually admitted it. Nobody else will admit it. But what he said was, I thought the market would correct. I thought those businessmen would act in their own interest and not crash the economy. And I was like, why would you think that, Mr. Grinsman? Why did you trust them? Because they're not going to do that. What they do is they all they think about is like the, the tragedy of the commons, right? I'm going to make as much money as I can before the economy collapses. And, um, and so they, they just kept going. And then after it collapsed, they convinced the politicians to bail them out. So they, <laughs> they didn't even pay that much of a price. Everybody but the rich paid a price. So these people are incredibly naive. There was another um, pro-capitalist guy, and he said, you know what? It hadn't occurred to me that if nature, uh, uh, if life on earth uh, ends, or if nature you know, turns into a desert, you won't be able to make any money off of it anymore, and the economies will go down. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> and then they'll say things like, they really do say stuff like this. They say, um, 
well, in order, we'll just adapt, just like with the herd immunity in COVID, right? We'll just let the herd immunity go, but we'll keep our economy going. It's just like adapting. We'll just keep our economy going. And then just think of all the money someone will make on gas masks when the air pollution gets bad enough. And just think how much money somebody will make when they figure out how to make clean water. Wow, you know, it'll be a great new business to make trillions of bucks selling people water because there's no water. Because <laughs> they'll come up with some technological way to make water. And, you know, think of, so they, they imagine that some wonderful entrepreneur and some wonderful science genius guy will get together. And the main thing for them is somebody will make a ton of money on all this pollution someday. <laughs> yeah, that's a mental disorder, I think. Um, but um, let's see. So trying to be objective and the people who Okay, then it's who decides to become a PhD in economics? What kind of person? Well, a person who is obsessed with math. And then you form this elite class of people who agree with each other. And then they publish in each other's journals. And you're not gonna get published. You won't have any status unless you go along with it. And the last thing was it's very male dominated. It's very patriarchal. Um, and, uh, and it presents men as rational and women as irrational. And it, uh, it favors men or people behaving like men. Um, so for example, women, it might be intuitively obvious to women that kids need attention, you know, love and attention and time, right? Spent on them, but, you know, it, it'll be men that send them off to work or force them, right? On the other hand, women want to develop themselves. And so they'll want to juggle family and career. That, that's reasonable. But the system will get set up so they can't be reasonable, right? Women cannot live reasonable lives where they have minds and they have bodies. And they're called irrational for that reason. And the economic system does not allow for like part-time work in higher, in careers that require uh, more college post, post undergrad training. And women are called irrational for that because they don't fit into the system. But the system is heartless, but it's called rational. All right. Uh, <laughs> So that was, that's, those articles are about that. Now, the next thing, what time is it? 11.15. So what I wanted to do was, okay, I put this article on, um, I guess somebody found it. I just put this on recently. And I think what I'll do, it's just 11.15, but what I'll do is I'll let you out earlier. But I, what I want you to do is read, um, okay, read the page, this page, 713, 714, and seven, let's see. Okay, 713 and 14, and then you can skip um, to, if you want to read it, it's interesting, but the industry of needs, right? Seven, um, 718 to 19. So 13, 14, 18, and 19. And let me just highlight a couple things to give you an idea of what the connection is between these, right? So on the one hand, the economists say, we're just being objective, right? And people just are irrational and it's not our fault. And then you find out what's really driving the economy is uh, making people the purpose of advertising. 
according to, you know, according in the past, the idea was advertising provides information to people so they know what to buy, right? That makes sense. Without information, we wouldn't make informed choices, right? Okay, that sounds great. Is that what it is? Okay, the contents of market messages, however, show that that is not what most marketing appeals to, right? Um, entire industries have manufactured a need for themselves. So people, there was a, a time in the 80s or something when marketing changed from informing people about your product to creating the desire for a product that they otherwise don't need, right? And so our economy in the US, it's 70% consumer driven, and most of that consumption is not things people need, right? People know what they need, right? Healthy food, right? You don't have to advertise healthy food. You just go buy it and eat it. Uh, but you have to advertise, you know, all this other stuff, different other clothing and all this stuff. And so here's the here's a summary of it. It is our job to make women unhappy with what they have, right? It's your job. To, to make women think they're too short or their eyelashes are too skinny, right? Or their hair is too straight or too curly, right? And so you really do promote women's uh, uh, lack of self-confidence, right? And you tell them they're not skinny enough or they're not this enough or they're not that enough or they need to have the trend. So advertising has now just created irrational desires. And so if you put that together with the article we just read, we're just objective. You know, we don't have values. We're value neutral. <laughs> but the advertisers will say, oh, no, we have values. We, we created, we made a huge profit. Look at all the jobs we created. Look at all this profit when we make, we make this kind of lipstick that is so special that women buy it for four bucks a stick and it costs us four cents to make it. But, you know, we got, we just, business is booming and this is great, right? And so on an economist model for objectivity, this is successful, but the actual, you know, the nature of the product is that it makes people, gives them all sorts of irrational desires. And then if the economist model doesn't work out, they just say, oh, people are too irrational, right? <laughs> so so um, the only way that advertising works and the only way that cost benefit actually works is when you're buying something you don't need and you're deciding how to, how to get the better product at the lower price. Um, like if you, you know, if you can buy a uh, generic brand lipstick as opposed to Max Factor lipstick, and it's the same, but more recent advertising is branding, right? You have to have the right brand of lipstick or you're not cool. <laughs> and so, uh, so that's the way. And what I really want you to think about, what I want you to write about in your post, have people in your countries bought into this stuff, right? Have they bought into this? Do they? I know that to some extent they have. There's the lotion that bleaches your skin so it's lighter. I know that in South Korea, that it's a notorious how many women spend how much money on, on surgery, plastic surgery, so they can look more like Westerners. Um, liposuction, breast implants, uh, facelifts, Botox, 
Uh, and, you know, and the economists will say, oh, this is great for the economy. Look at all the, the economy added X jobs and X billions of bucks this year because Max Factor, you know, created a new kind of facelift where women, <laughs> that women think makes them more beautiful. Or, I mean, oh, anyway. So I am gonna ask each of you to react to that general idea and to think that, do you think people in your country are getting sucked into this? I know when I taught it in, um, at AUW the first time the students came into class and they go, oh my gosh, you know. I, this one girl said, it was, it was amazing. This one girl said, oh my gosh, I'm so embarrassed because my president um, doesn't, didn't let us eat fish eggs on, I think it was a certain number of months in the year. And she loves fish eggs, which I think we call caviar which I've never had, it's super expensive. But in her country, I think it was Myanmar, it's, you know, everybody eats it. And she loves it, it's good. She said, I was so mad at my president. And now I read about fish, you know, fish eggs and about the environment and how the reason he did that was because that the supplies were going down and they needed to reproduce during, and I'm so embarrassed, right? So, the students started to understand that they'd gotten brainwashed into this stuff. And they did think they weren't, you know, light skinned enough or, you know, round eyed enough or whatever enough. So they had sort of gotten sucked into this advertising and they were buying stuff they didn't need or they were fantasizing about buying it, right? It's what they wanted for their life. So, um, so I would like you to put that in your posts. But before, before I finish the class, um, I just want, what, the five of you to just say, do you think, does, this, does all this stuff start to hang together for you? And can you see this? And do you think people in your country are getting sucked in by this corrupt kind of advertising? Sauda? Yes, Professor. Uh, can you repeat your question? Well, Sorry, I... do you understand how the economists claim they're objective? Oh, uh, yeah. Okay. And they're not, right? Absolutely not. And then, not only that, but they use all of their economic statistics and their understanding of human behavior to manipulate people so that they have all these irrational emotions so that they yes. will buy the products and make the profit and the economists say oh the economy is booming yeah like they're, they're constantly trying to like manipulate people and like creating needs that are like doesn't exist that the, that are like meaningless but like they're constantly pushing that like via advertisement they're using people's like emotions and just pushing this agenda that you need this you need this you need this in order to be happy when it's all really nothing it's meaningless it's just matter they're pushing that materialistic agenda just for like profit. And it's really not needed. I mean, those things that are nothing. It's just totally. It's called, it's called being successful and rational, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, according to them. So can you think of examples? of um, products that Bangladeshi people routinely sort of like, and it's not helping. <laughs> Is there any sort of consumer product that's very, every, you just have to have it, you know, or you're not cool? I mean, 
most uh, I would say electronics, phones, gadgets, those are things like, even if you have a phone that's like really well functioning and it fulfills all your needs, you can use it for anything that you need, internet, just like calling, texting, messaging, you wanna listen to music, whatever, Every, it works, everything fine, but you'll still like exchange it for a new phone a new newer version new, newer model that does the exact same thing but it's just more expensive and you have to have it but okay. why it's yeah. only because the advertisement companies they're marketing it as something cool that you need but in reality you don't it's like it's just the advertisement there's another thing for young people your age that I think that the wealthy middle-aged people exploit the weaknesses of adolescents by, you know, making girls feel like they're not attractive enough or making, oh, yes. or making guys feel like they're not virile enough, right? And I, I think that's a real um, corruption between the generations, right? I mean... There's like, okay, then that this is like another conversation would come up. It's just that the color, colorism of everything that's like very present here, and especially targeted towards like girls, women, that you have to be fairer in order to be perceived as attractive and in order to be, uh, like seen as marriageable and like all of those other things. So you have to be fair and there's all kinds of pro bleaching products and all of this, so many types of like uh, creams and beauty products that would lighten your skin and stuff like that. And it's just so much, even, even whenever you open TV, you'll see that. I mean, recently, uh, so there's a fair and lovely, there's like uh, one like product, it's like, I think for the whole South Asia, uh, predominantly this, they supplied product, like they're like the most uh, popular brand for a skin whitening cream. And they've like recently rebranded their name and changed it to, from fair and lovely to glow and lovely because like after it's been I think that company has been uh here for more than like 50 years it's been a long time it's like really old and only recently they changed their name it's all because they were some people like they were they were criticized for being pushing this colorist agenda and stuff like that. But they've been doing it for 50 plus years and nobody cared before. But recently like they're changing. So it's it, it's just one brand changing their name, but they're still doing, they changed the name, but they're still marketing the same thing. And they're still doing <laughs> everything else. Like the damage is still there. They're still manipulating young, girls and creating this agenda but it's but just changing the name right that's all about branding right yeah it, yeah you just put a different a package wrapping paper on top right and yep. somebody will buy it because oh it's blue wrapping paper and not green wrapping paper <laughs> i mean that's so sad soda um do you think so it is just because maybe the old name sounded racist or something, or is it because they got in trouble with the law or anything, or just because mm -hmm. they they decided they were going to change the brand so that people don't associate their product with yeah. this public criticism? Yeah, and mainly like public criticism. So in social media and a lot of, they were like be criticized, they're getting criticized for being colorist and pushing this and that and all this blah 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 so some uh in social media like some people were criticizing them for this and you know they're 
reputation was getting uh, negative. Like, yeah, they used it. Really and I, then, like, they just wanted to protect their image. And so they just changed the name from Fair to Glow. And it's just the same thing. It's still doing the same thing, but <laughs> it's yeah, they're uh, trying to, you know, salvage it and like repackage it. Hey, just as a, you know, rebranding, I guess. And um, it's know, still, yeah. it's not like there are any less colorist or racist now. It's the same thing, just repackaging. Yeah, I, you know, it's it's so sad because. I mean, when you say that, that all of a sudden I'm not innocent anymore, but I never look at the students in terms of their, right, their skin color, you know, how fair or whatever. And if anything, you know, in my country where we have these northerners who have, you know, pale skin, they're always, they're getting cancer by going to these tanning places, right? And trying to get darker skin. And um, light-skinned people get age spots, you know, and they're uglier and they get more wrinkles. I mean, I, it just is absolutely bizarre in terms of people with darker skin and more melatonin are more resistant to the sun. I mean, it's just in terms of the facts, their skin is better, <laughs> especially in time now with climate change and more sun. And why do you want to look like somebody who's really going to pay a price? <laughs> They're going to all get skin cancer. I've already had a cancerous little thingy in my arm because I spent too much time in the Greek sun, but it was worth it. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, I mean, the fair-skinned people are not very adaptive. So how is it the advertisers make people who actually are physically more adapted to not like themselves, right? It's incredible. It's just like, I guess, another, it's it's an, another side effect from the yeah. colonialism, so. Yes, it is. It's it's just colonialism all over again. And I, I just wish the people wouldn't fall for it. But I mean, I wish people in my country wouldn't fall for a whole lot of stuff. Um, yeah, anyway, so Sristi, can you think of an example? Can you understand the connection here where the e economics professors claim to be objective and they're not at all? They really have an agenda. And then business owners really exploit people and their desires and their emotions. And then they call it rational and successful if they can sell a product. Does that make sense to you, Sristi? Not there? Kanij, are you there? Yes, ma'am. Oh. Um, Sristi said that. Yeah. What? Can you hear me, Professor? What? Can you hear me? Hello? Yeah. Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, okay, stop. So there is something uh, also I have to say about a bank in Bangladesh. Like, there were two kinds of banks. And one is government bank and another one is, like, Islamic bank. Yes. But um, of the bank will give you benefits, but... Only the Islamic bank uh, claim and post that uh, they are use the Islamic way and they don't give any benefits and uh, put money in bank and taking benefits from that is not supported by Islam. So people nowadays uh, go to not to the government bank but the Islamic bank just to tell that we don't take benefits and we don't take money from that but honestly they do. Just this is the difference between two banks. So every people go to the Islamic bank to open a bank account and keep money and taking benefits, but not the government. So if they go government office, then people will know that, yeah, they do it, they take benefits, then people will know it. But when they go to the Islamic bank, they, they can 
lie to the people that no, we don't take benefits. But honestly, they do because both the both bank are same. It's just government bank and the Islamic bank. The name is the different. So these things I found out that as a really big issue in my eye right now. Actually, I mean, it goes back to the Bible or the Quran, right? Which says you can't take interest, right? You can't loan for interest. Yeah. Um, that's that is, yeah. And so, yeah, I, I knew that. And when I was in Indonesia, I knew about that. And I could never quite figure out how can you run a bank if you don't charge some kind of interest, right? So you must be getting around it somehow. Um, and then it's, the... It's, also it's also funny it's it's also funny like um every people know about it and people just go to islamic bank and they think that people that it's stupid they don't understand anything but honestly everyone do and 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 it's 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 really ridiculous <laughs> well the other thing i had heard was that when the international economy collapsed that the Muslim banks were not in all those networks and they did better. They didn't falter as much. Is that true? Do any of you know about that? I mean, it makes sense to me. Uh, well, um, my elder brother worked in a bank. Uh, he's a banker. So as far as I know that, honestly, they give the uh interest but like uh not as the government of is but like a little bit less than them but they do give interest that's what i know but yeah so that's the thing uh, i mean if i can add i think the principle for islami banks uh are that they will like if you keep money there they will use your money for businesses or whatever to invest and they will, if they earn the, any profit from that investment, they will give you some profit, but there is no guarantee that they will, the investments will gain profit, right? It, it, it could go wrong and they might lose money. So you will give investing, you giving the, you'll be giving bank the money at a risk so but most people are so they don't they won't promise any profits that's right. like the principle where the government so you, you, could, you could earn money or you could lose your money so you whenever you're investing you're investing at a risk or you're keeping your money in the bank at a risk but i guess most of the people still do that uh, still you know takes that risk to be i guess religious they do keep them any halal as we say so and also because most of the time that's that all of the islami banks they don't go bankrupt or they don't show as much you know loss as normal banks so I mean, uh, in that case, I mean, normal banks, they don't, uh, they're giving you interest so that they completely run on different principles and different ways. So, I mean, it's just the principle that you, we, it, this is not the interest, the profit that we are giving you. It's not interest. It's just like profit. And you could, you know, lose money as well. I mean, it, that's the principle, but you know, it's kind of unrealistic that a bank will always, whatever you're doing, it will always gain profit because nobody can guarantee that, right? So it's kind of absurd in that way because nobody can like always be profitable all the time, like forever. You'll have to lose money one time or another. So, which is also like, how are they how are they sustaining so many customers with this kind of risks so right. i mean okay. we, so i guess people, people will... they put their money in the islamic bank and the islamic bank will give you a loan and i think Connage is saying but they do charge interest 
they don't call it that they call it something else yeah 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 right as far as i know it's yeah and, and it's true honestly it's true it, it it's really true and every person know about it but like they're just okay yeah i know but uh every people do it but everyone is silent like they are not really yeah so what's the problem i keep learning the islamic bank so what's the big deal but honestly it does well the other thing is that it is true that if it's a government bank it's guaranteed right the government will uh fill in if there's a collapse and i would imagine that's not true with the muslim banks i mean i think both of you are right does that make sense that, uh -huh. that would be both uh, yeah. of those things. It's, I guess different. So for private banks, there's they run on different like ID. I don't know. Should I call it ideology? I mean different principles. So each bank there's lo lots of uh, Islamic bank and and lots of other private banks as well that run on interest like any other bank. So right. each bank each company each bank they will have their own set of principles and rules and everything and for the islamic banks i guess there's multiple islamic bank and you know a lot of them are most of the uh, islamic banks they kind of run on this impression that no we are not giving interest but that's so they good they have a good marketing strategy let's put it that way <laughs> they've yeah. calculated their self-interest and they've gotten customers to buy their product and uh nobody you know hey they're successful right <laughs> does everybody understand that <laughs> like that's how they market themselves yeah and so it's just a marketing strategy that's all it is and it works and so that's from a detached objective point of view it's a good business right and it increases the national economy and blah 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 <laughs> okay mosa do you have something no mm -hmm. no you can't think of any products that people buy that they only buy it because the the marketers were really smart in figuring out how to punch people's buttons to get them to buy it. Yeah, professor. That is me. Well, can you think of one? Think of one. <laughs> At this time, no idea coming in my head for this. The idea I had already shared. Oh yeah, the lotion one. That must be a pretty big deal. Um, all right, well, I guess I'll just let you go. It's getting late, you know? And so for those people on YouTube, um, I will write in the announcement that I would like you to read those four pages or so. Um, if you have time to read the rest of them, it's interesting, but it's mostly about America. And especially this big campaign to get children, get children to nag their parents to buy stuff. And it's just like, it's so sick, right? Because there's so many important connections you need to make with your children and to sit and have to deal with, you know, arguments about consumption because some genius marketer got your kid's emotion, you know, was really good at punching the kid's emotional buttons. I think that's awful. And um, Me. what? Me. Yeah. Um, you told me to remember some things about us, I think. And it was you post in June 21, it was make a post on love for those who are behind. You told me to remember this in the class and you will say some you will say something to our classes about this assignment. I just couldn't oh, understand. Uh, you don't understand? 
No. Do you think you could type it in? Uh, okay. So there was an assignment in the class. You said that we don't need to do it. Uh, you put it like mistakenly, and that assignment was uh, putting by June 21, and the title was makeup post on look for those who are behind. Okay. So. And it told me, remember this in the class, and you will say this the rest of the class. Okay. So there's a makeup. I understand now. Not really. So <laughs> I, I did create a makeup post, right? Yeah. I and think, June 21. I think you can just uh, disregard that. Like, so the, just look at the last announcement Professor made. And there she said, like, we're supposed to do 12 posts. So as long as you do 12 posts in from all of the classes, right? like we have 15 posts now, including this class. class. So you, if you do any 12 of them, that's the right. Right. So that you need I, to feel. I think that's that. Right. There's 15 for this, this is number 15, and then there'll be 16 and 17, but you only have to do 12. Miss A, what is the last date for a uh, research paper? It is August. Well, August 1st, yeah. It's yeah. August 1st, right? It's okay. Was okay. that the research paper or the final paper? August 1st. Um, if if I said both, whatever I said, I said it on the announcement. Um, so yeah, just look at the announcement. And I, I really don't want to misspeak because I, well, I suppose I could look at it. It's here. Um, let's see. What does the announcement say? Um, climate change data. Research papers are due July 25th. That's what I thought. The posts are due the 29th and the final papers are due August 1st. Okay. Uh, okay, so the research paper and final paper are different. I'm confused. Yes. Did I mean, did you read the syllabus? Um, so there was one paper due, uh, I don't know, a month ago. Okay, what did the syllabus say, which I have, you know, referred to, I mean, I keep describing these different papers, so, um, but, you know, you can always look at the syllabus. Um, so, June 11th, your first paper was due, um, The Legacy of the Enlightenment. Um, it was a thousand words. Um, then the second paper was the research paper. And I had that one due July 1st, 1200 words and three sources on some science, social science, some aspect of environmental ethics. And then the final paper is 1700 due August 1st. And I can knock that down to 1500, that's fine. And then I knocked this down to 12 posts. Um, yeah, okay, so I did June 11th, a thousand words. The first one, sorry, June 1st. The next one was 1200 words. The last one I would say 1500 and that's it. So I think I, you know, I keep referring to it and I, I posted places where you can post your papers um, so, I mean, I'm glad this is being recorded because I guess I assume students know this, but that's fine. Any other questions? Professor, I would like to talk to you after, uh, after the class for five minutes. Will you okay. be available? Sure. Thank you. Um, any, any other clarification that you need? Anindita, are you there? Please, please, um, if you're there, please chat something.
because if I don't hear from you and I don't hear a chat, I can't really call you present. You know, I've got to have some signal that you're there. Um, so if you can't even chat, you can send me an email. Just let me know if you were listening to the class. And if not, you know, it's an absence and maybe it's excusable. I don't know. But you, you should know, you know, that I would need to, as your teacher, I need to know <laughs> when students are just turning on their video and, and leaving. Um, okay, so that's enough. If students want to leave, that's fine. And then I'll just talk to Mosa. And if you have any other questions, um, I have the usual office hours. Let's see. Moments bye. Good night, Miss. Good night. Um, Good morning. Good day. Good night. Yeah. Hmm. Okay, so. Um.